So, welcome. And our next speakers are Sofia Seli and Jure van Perchen. And they are going to tell you about the newest version of the of the record protocol, version four. And as well as encryption, they are going to touch on morality and ethics and why we encrypt and why we need uh, communication. So please welcome Sofia and Yure. So hello and welcome, I am Sofia and this is Jure and as it was said, we're going to present the version for the OTR protocol, but we are also going to, we named this talk No Evidence of Communication and Morality in Protocols for a reason and you will see during the talk why. So the first thing that came to, us, to our mind when we decided to present the version 4 of the OTR protocol was to talk to the audience about why we need, uh, why, why we need secure messaging. And for this, we decided to quote one of the most famous papers in cryptography that was done by Philip Rogaway in 2015, which is called The Moral Character of Cryptographic Work. And this paper starts by saying that most academic cryptographers seem to think that a field is a fun, deep, and political neutral game, a set of puzzles involving communicating parties and notional adversaries. This vision of who we are and it makes a field whose work is intellectually impressive and rapidly produced, but also quite inbred and divorced from the real world concern. Is this what cryptography should be like? Is it how we should expand the bulk of our intellectual capital? The reason why we wanted to show this quote is basically that for a start of a talk is to start inquiring in ourselves if what the work that we're doing is actually the work that we should be doing. Because at the end of the day, we as privacy and security developers or cryptographers or software developers, we own the product and the design decisions we do for the real world people who are the ones who are going to use. And if we're going to give a protocol or an algorithm or a product to them, then it should be also interpreted with ethical and moral decisions. And of course, Rogabay's um, does a lot of points in his paper, but uh, there's a special paragraph that actually concerns the main focus of our talk, in which he talks that basically one of the things that sometimes have been abandoned by cryptographic or security or privacy research is the problem of the secure messaging. He says that, of course, there has been some research and, of course, there are some options, but there has not been that much intensive research. And one of the reasons why I'm presenting today OTR in its version 4 is because since the beginning, OTR tried to solve this problem of secure messaging and tried to give to the user back its privacy that sometimes big corporations or government have actually taken away from them. And of course, as I already said, there's a, rather, a lot of, um, not a lot, but some um, alternatives to the secure messaging protocols. There's a lot of protocols that try to do that, but in this talk we will also argue why we need actually a protocol that of, like OTR that actually uh, sets uh, the bars around the definitions, limitations of properties that we need when creating a protocol. So one of the things that of course if we want to solve the secure messaging problem, because this is a problem that uses actually need to be solved because one of the things that real world users do in the internet is communicate between each other, so we actually need to solve this problem. And one of the things that we need in order to solve this problem is to give to the users uh, options that work. Sometimes a lot of secure messaging protocols don't actually give any implementation for the user to use or actually good de design decisions so they can actually know what they are using. We also need full specifications. It's not enough to actually do a secure messaging protocol that is only defined between three blog posts or a half page specification or just an implementation. We actually need protocols that are uh, highly structured enough and that, um, say that, uh, that not only say what crypto cryptographic algorithms are used, but actually define how these al cryptographic algorithms are used and how they relate to each other. It is not enough to say in a protocol that you use elliptic curve cryptography, you have to take into account how elliptic curve cryptography um, works between each with other algorithms and how it takes into account different kinds of attack. I don't know, may the four be with you, side channels attack, cofactor issues, etc., etc. So we need full uh, structured uh, specifications. We also need to define a specific, uh, specifically which properties a protocol is going to try to solve by saying, okay, this is try to solve 
deniability and all of the types of deniability, or only some types of deniability. It tries to solve perfect forward secrecy or whatever property it is. A protocol should also define which limitations it has, because a protocol cannot solve them all. Um, in OTR before, as we were going to see in some next slides, for example, we didn't try to solve the post-quantum algorithm, uh, the quantum computing problem, because obviously post-quantum algorithms, and as you can see if you attended Tanya Langes and Daniel Bernstein's talk yesterday, you will see that post-quantum algorithms are not good enough right now to be deployed. We also need protocols that update existing definitions, because a lot of people sometimes say that we have our already a protocol, so why should we update to another protocol if we already have one that looks good enough? It might look good enough today, but in the future, or right now, already the academia has uh, actually defined in a proper way the definitions of the security properties that your protocol is trying to attain. Of course, for protocols, we also need review and verifications because it's not enough to put a protocol on the internet and expect that users use it. It has to have formal verifications, revision by several parties, by cryptographers, software developers, etc., and verifications. We also need implementations, and by implementations, I mean a code that can actually run on several operating systems that can compile and actually run. And of course, um, most importantly, we also need ideas from different places. Something that we are very proud of from the uh, version 4 of OTI is that actually most of the developers of OTI come from Latin America, specifically from Ecuador and Brazil. Uh, sometimes we actually need ideas coming from different places because it's not enough to just have ideas from a certain region of the world and impose them into another region of the world. You will find that there are very good ideas from other parts of the world that need the attention as well. All right. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about um, what actually is OTR, uh, off-the-record messaging, and what exactly is deniability. So in the beginning, um, there were three people who wrote a paper, yeah, Ian Goldberg, Nikita Borisov, and Eric Brewer, and they created this paper called Off-the-Record Messaging. Um, basically, what they wanted is that they wanted to have messaging algorithms and, and, and protocols in the world that would sort of mimic conversations you would have casually like in the real world and bring that to the digital world, right? So what PGP did, for example, is that you can sign a message where you can say, oh, this message is actually written by me. Um, but in the real world, what you want uh, is actually say, I have a conversation with Sophie that I know it's Sophie, but if we have a one-on-one -on -one conversation somewhere, nobody knows what was actually said. And that's something we wanted to, that, that um, uh, you know, Ian and, and the others wanted to incorporate into um, a an, an cryptographic protocol. And so um, uh, they did that, um, and then it went through several uh, revisions. Um, and one of the cool things as well is that you can sort of authenticate somebody, right, in a deniable way. We'll get more into that later on. Um, but sometimes, you know, you want to sort of verify that the person who still controls a certain account, like over XMPP or over ISC, um, you want to verify that that is still the real person that you are expecting. And that was done through like the Socialist Millionaire Protocol, where you can sort of authenticate somebody, uh, f sorry, verify somebody. Um, and, you know, uh, OTR gave like inspiration to like a bunch of other secure messaging protocols, uh, and Signal was, was definitely one of them. And so some of the properties that OTR has is like authentication. So there's like an authenticated key exchange. There's a variant of the Sigma protocol, which, signs, which stands for the sign and uh, Mac protocol. But what was different in the OTR version is that they sort of removed the signing part. Um, and it still worked through the, through the Mac stuff because you can sort of like, because just like what I said before, you don't always want signatures and, and they uh, achieved it this way. Um, and then through the verification, right, the social millionaire protocol, you can sort of like have a shared secret or have like a question and answer uh, where you can ask a certain question and hopefully this person only knows the answer to that question that you ask. Um, as well as like fingerprint comparison, like out of band. Um, and then, you know, it has end to end encryption, so all messages are encrypted between the two devices that are talking to each other. And so, another <coughs> important thing is, is like the perfect forward secrecy, right? So, uh, there's like unique keys for every. Um, 
conversation that you're having, like every message and every like session that you have. And why this is important is that, let's say you know, device gets compromised um, and somebody gets access to your phone, then at least um, the attacker can't decrypt the messages that were sent earlier because every uh, session has like a unique key. Um, and then the post-compromise security right is that even if a message key gets compromised, no future messages can be decrypted. Um, where if Alice has like a security guarantee about communication with Bob, even if Bob's secrets have already been compromised, um, you know they can't really do anything with that. And so we get to the deniability part. Um, so the deniability in like the OTR version three, which is like the, the sort of like previous version of OTR, is that um, you know. <laughs> Considering a scenario where Bob accuses Alice of sending a specific message, Justin or just must decide whether or not he believes that Alice actually did so. And if Bob can provide evidence that Alice sent that message, so this is a valid cryptographic signature of the message, in the Alice long term key, then we say that the action is wrong, non reputable. Otherwise, the action is deniable. Um, and so, what has sort of changed in the OTR version 4, um, the deniability part is that um, it has sort of like the deniability has expanded. So, let's start with the two easy ones. One of them is the methods. So, if you're sending a, a message, you can sort of like deny that you have sent that message, but you can also deny that you actually are participating or had participated in that message, in that conversation with somebody. And then the offline one is that, let's say, we had a conversation and we ended the conversation, we can you know, forge the transcript afterwards. And online is, is that somebody might try to collude with the network somehow to try and figure out like, what's going on. And also, that party cannot um, verify that you're actually having that conversation. Um, of course, you know, cryptographic protocols are never a silver bullet. So you shouldn't just rely on deniability for like uh, you know your perfect operational security. Um, and a protocol is strongly deniable. Transcripts provide no evidence, even if long-term key material is compromised. And now outsider can obtain evidence, even if an insider interactively colludes with them, which is the online deniability. Okay, so basically what we try to attain in the full version of OTR is that we wanted to have all of the properties that OTR had, plus all of the academic definitions that have already been updated. We wanted to have forward secrecy, post-compromise secrecy, but also online deniability, offline deniability, deniability, participation deniability, and message deniability. One of the reasons why in the past OTR did not define all of these deniabilities was because in the academia there was vague terms around what online deniability was and offline deniability one was. But what we wanted with the version 4 is to update this protocol to catch up with what the academia, ha academia has already defined so we can put that onto a protocol that can be used by the real world people. And as you see here, we have pointed a table of comparison between the most popular secure messaging protocols. Um, OTR has most of the poor properties. Um, of course, in some cases, we don't have the full property. You only partially provide the property. And this is something that we also wanted to make very clear with OTR to say the limitations that the protocol has. Not only try to say to the user, oh, this has it all, it actually has some limitations. Um, some of the properties and the mapping that we have made of other secure messaging protocols might not be that accurate enough because we have based our research on the protocols of these secure messaging protocols uh, or the blog posts that sometimes they have. And sometimes these blog posts are not updated enough. So yeah, be aware. OK. So what we have for version 4 of OTR? Of course, as we already said, we wanted deniability. We wanted deniability in all of its form. As Yuri has already pointed out, we wanted participation, message, online and offline deniability. We also wanted to give a strong perfect forward secrecy and post-compromise secrecy. We also wanted to update the highest security level, and this is related to the next point, which is that we also wanted to update the cryptographic primitives. Why is this important in the secure messaging protocol? 
is because most of the times you have algorithms and you think, OK, this algorithm is good enough. But then, of course, someone finds an attack against this algorithm or an issue of the implementation of that algorithm. So we should also update the cryptographic primitives to something that has enough cryptanalysis and is good enough to use. Um, we also wanted to, pro to provide additional protection against transcript decryption in the case of ECC compromise. We wanted to use elliptic curves. This is a very important point because one of the things, as I have already said in the past, is that we don't provide quantum resistance in OTR before. And one of the reasons is because, as I said, uh, there's a still no quantum algorithms that are good enough to be used right now in a massive way. Um, we will wait until the NIST competi competition is over to maybe reconsider this thought. But the NIST competition is still ongoing, so we will still have to wait on that. But in the case that quantum machines come earlier as we thought, then at least we will use a Diffie-Hellman of a very large prime. So it will be more difficult to break this very large prime Diffie-Hellman than the elliptic curve cryptography. But of course, we also wanted to use elliptic curves because elliptic curves have a smaller prime but um, they have the same security level, uh, bigger security level. We also wanted to incorporate a new communication model that now we have. When OTR was first developed, we, uh, it only supported synchronous online conversation. And right now, we also need online and offline conversations. So that is something that OTR before also provides. We also provide in order and out of order delivery of messages. We also give the implementers several ways in which OTR before can be implemented, because sometimes implementers only want to implement the online version of it. And of course, we also don't want to trust servers, because servers can be tricky to manage. Um, we don't want to trust them, and that's the way that we use the Denable Authenticated Key Exchange, which is a mechanism by which you authenticate the other party in a Denable way, and you also generate a shared secret. That mechanism uh, for the offline mode needs a untrusted server that is going to cache for some time ephemeral material. Here you have the main changes. If you go to our repository and our protocol, you will find it, uh, just to show. OK, um, some design decisions. Um, of course, uh, instead of something simpler, as people has, has put it, um, we use DEXZ and XCDH, which are two DEICs. As I defined, DEICs is a Denable Authenticated Key Exchange. Um, and we wanted to have these two DEICs because these are the ones that mostly give the deniability properties that we need. We also wanted to use the elliptic curve ET448 Goldilocks by Mike Hamburg because it gave us the security level that you, we wanted to attain. Of course, as I already said, because we wanted to make sure that quantum computers might take some time to decrypt some parts of OTR before, we also wanted to use a DV Hellman uh, 3072. We wanted to use Shake and Exalsa 20. Shake is the hash function that we use in OTR before. Exalsa 20 is the encryption algorithm that we use. The reason why we wanted to use them is to update the cryptographic primitives. Of course, we wanted to use the double ratchet algorithm because it's the algorithm that will give us perfect forward secrecy by the means of always encrypting one message with one unique key. Uh, some of the questions that people sometimes have posed to us, what is the toolkit? The toolkit is um, something that OTR before always provides. It's basically a way to prove to the people that look into OTR that actually this gives the deniability properties that it claims to have. Um, I have already said that we don't support post-quantum algorithms and the reasons for that. And of course, we also don't have group chat. The reason why don't, we don't have group chat is because there has not been a good mapping of which deniability properties and security privacy properties we need for group chat. And there is not a way of, to create a very strong, strongly deniable um, communication in a group chat. OK, well. <laughs> Uh, of course, as I said at the beginning, one of the things that we should also have when we design a protocol is that it should also have a good implementation, an implementation that runs in most of the operative system, an implementation that compiles, an implementation that runs. And for this, we wanted to have a real-world implementation. Right. So we did that through col collaborating with uh, two different entities, main, mainly the cryptographers who worked on like um, the deniable key exchange um, at the University of Waterloo, and the developers who you know have implemented cryptographic primitives, but also like working on like the actual like code of the specification uh, that is OTR version four. Um, so uh, that came out. You know, Lib, Lib Goldilocks is an 
uh, extension of libdcaf from like Hamburg, uh, where we uh, said, well, we only are going to use ED448 for like a specific encoding. Um, there's going to be um, we have people in, uh, at the moment working on different implementations, and why that is important is that you know we want to be able to also like test it out and see where there's any uh, flaws maybe in the specifications or things that are unclear. And so far, that has helped us to um, clarify certain parts of the specification um, and improve those parts. Um, and you know we've been collaborating with the cryptographers while they were writing the papers, um, and a lot of the revisions of this uh, work have been reviewed by Ian Goldberg and Nick Unger, um, who have worked on like the deniable key exchange uh, paper as well as like uh, OTR in general. Yeah, related to the point, it's always important when designing a protocol that if you're using a paper, it would be good to always um, refer to the author, so have collaborations with the author, so you are sure that you're implementing the cryptographic algorithm that is defining the paper in a good way. And actually, this is the paper we are based upon mainly. Our decks are based upon the first paper by Nick Unger and Ian Goldberg. That's the ed 448 Goldilocks by Mike Hamburg. And of course, we have already been quoted in other papers, like in this paper from the Alto University. Yeah. Um, of course, if we wanted to do a real-world implementation, we needed to choose a programming language in which we were going to implement this, and we chose to do an implementation in C. As Yuri has already said, there's already some ongoing efforts of actually implementing in Python, Java, and Golang, but the main library has been written in C. What we want to see? Well, C is always the library that C is always the programming language that is often used as a reference, and most of the libraries that we use were written in C, in C, so we wanted to use the same programming language. But of course, when you use C, you will have some problems with memory handling. Um, I don't know if you attended uh, previously a talk called MemSat, in which actually uh, the talker explained some of the problems in memory handling, but we had to, um, to verify this memory handling in our library in a good way, because if we're going to provide a library that is going to be used by the real people, then it has to not have the memory problems that some libraries has. For that, we tried to we incorporate in the static testing by using Clant ID and Splint. Uh, we also use Balgrin to check buffer overflows, double freeze, uh, usage with, uh, after a free, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and various address sanitizers. Uh, of course, we also wanted to have um, testing in our library in the form of unit and integration. This is something that is always so uh, very needed in libraries because um, sometimes people. Um, push in production some libraries that don't actually verify correctly all of the edge cases that a library can have in its development process, and we wanted to make sure that everything was uh, okay. And something that actually on the talk of yesterday by Daniel Langer and Daniel Bernstein said is that we also should put on the cryptographic things or design, or when designing algorithms, we should also make an strive for code that can be readable. Because sometimes your library is going to be used by other software developers, and so other software developers should be able to understand how, uh, how the library is actually working. So we wanted code that, we, that can be used by other developers. We also wanted to give recommendations to developers, because yes, it's, it's true that we created this protocol and we created the design of this protocol, but not because of that we just should push the protocol out of there and just say, try to implement it in any way, but actually try to keep in touch with the community, give recommendations, clarify things that may not be good enough in the protocol. This actually makes the protocol mu much more robust um, because we catch up some errors that maybe cryptographers didn't catch up, security privacy experts didn't catch up, but software developers implementing the protocol did catch up. All right, and just like Sophie said, uh, we've been doing testing, but we also think it's important to actually test on like various architectures and operating systems. So uh, we actually found like a couple of bugs while we were running the test suite on like uh, some of the um, online like test suites, um, mainly being like different GCC and Clang versions on like different um, uh, uh, operating systems and, dis and distributions from Linux. And that actually like caught some problems every now and again. Um, we also want to you know, get better support on like the various BSDs that are out there. And so we started working on like 
um, you know, uh, continuous integration for those platforms. Um, and one also one f one sort of funny thing is that um, Debian, you know, has like various architectures, um, and they also have like sort of like Unix-like systems. So we managed to like find some problems on like the the GNU herd uh, that is out there, and some other. Uh, more exotic like architectures on like MIPS and uh, PowerPC, um, and it actually helps to sort of like have like a wide range of Im of uh, architectures that we check for any mistakes. Yeah, and something that is also very important when doing a cryptographic protocol that real world people are going to use is that we should always prioritize the real world people that is going to use it. Because at the end of the day, the user matters. If you're pushing someone to something to the world, then of course some user is going to use it. So we try also to, at least when we did uh, our implementation of the plugin to the pitching client, to at least make the dialogues, dialogues, dialogues more understandable on how they actually try to attain. Like for example, if, if it's the process of generating a private key, then it should be clear enough to the user what that, process, that that process is happening. And of course, something that, as we said, is also needed when you are designing a protocol and something that we tried to include on OTR before is actually doing formal verifications of all the protocol. So we tried, so right now there's an ongoing work on actually doing a model checker of the protocol state machine that is going to be done in the tool CMurphy, and eventually we want a full protocol for formal verification. This is important because, as I said, this is one of the reasons why you should have a full structured protocol, because sometimes between the interaction of one state to other state is when errors and mistakes occur. So you actually need to formally check all of these steps to catch up maybe issues or mistakes or potential bugs that can happen in a protocol. Right, and we also really care a lot about security. So especially in cryptographic protocols, we actually want to be sure that the code that people are using is like reasonably secure. So we want to sort of like start working towards fuzzing. So we want to integrate parts like libfuzzer and using like stuff like AFL. And hopefully we can run that on like the, uh, the, the OSS first, which is an, an initiative by Google where they provide uh, app engine um, computational time in order to run like fuzzing tests. Um, and we also really welcome community audits. So, um, there's like a security PGB key on like security at OTR.im. Um, so if you ever want to email about any flaws that you find, please use something like this or email the OTR v4 people um, on the, the, the Autonomia Digital email address. Um, and we, you know, we don't uh, only stop there. We also actually want to get an, a professional security audit uh, by the code that we've been uh, coding. Okay, so just to have in conclusion, what we wanted to attain with OTR before is to design a very structured protocol specification that actually say how the interaction between different cryptographic algorithms work to check that everything is correct. We wanted to also give to the users a real world implement a real world specification that actually is structured enough, says what limitations this protocol has, says which design decision it has, says, says which requirements it needs, because that's sometimes something that the users and implementers actually may need, because the user may choose between different protocols depending on how the specification is defined. We also wanted to give this real-world implementation that didn't only care about implementing it just in whatever way, in whatever programming languages, but actually to make sure that this is an implementation that is production-ready, that can be used by people, and that can be used to base other implementations upon that. That coming again with what we started at the beginning with the Philip Rogerway's paper, basically that's what we try to do in OTR, that this is a protocol that tries to solve the problem of denability as a basic right of people when they're having a communication in the digital world, and also as something that takes into account this morality and takes into account the requirements and needs of the users when they actually need something that is specified good enough, that is implemented good enough for them. Yeah, and check out our repos. Uh, they are in GitHub. This is the protocols. We also have the library in C, the pre key server, um, the toolkit, uh, our implementation, half implementation, which is not done <laughs> in Golan. The implementation in Java that was done, the, done by Danny is, been, is going by Danny Van Hoyman. And yeah, and check out also our website. 
And we also wanted to thank everybody. Okay. <laughs> okay yeah. Um, so also just to like add like a, a little thing. So we have like a sort of OTR com community website called OTR.im, which also has a GitHub, a GitHub instance, and we have like various like continuous integration possibilities. So if you ever want to move from uh, GitHub, for example, or GitLab, um, we are like happy to host you um, on this platform um, and provide uh, um, continuous integration c capabilities for you. Okay, we also wanted to thank everyone involved. OTR before has been a protocol that has been done by a lot of people from all over, I think, from almost all of the continents in the world. Um, we wanted here to show up the people who have more than 6,000 lines of collaboration or code or text in a repository, but there's much more. If you can, you want to know who, have, who has collaborated, you can, also ch you can always check our repositories. Here's some time for reference if you want to know the papers we based upon this talk. And yeah, questions? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And of course, thank everyone involved for the amazing work on OTR. And thank you for the great presentation. We have time for questions. So line up in front of the microphones. We have five of them um, in the front and in the back of the hall. We're going to take a question from the internet first. Um, the question is, are you in touch with developers of popular messaging applications such as Signal? And if yes, um, it, will the protocol also support uh, media other than text such as VOIP or video or something? OK. Um, attached? I don't know. But yeah, we have, um, we have not collaborated with them. Uh, specifically, we just have collaborated with um, the people who in the past did OTR because they are the ones who also did right now the newest papers. And the reason why we wanted only to update OTR is because OTR has always been the inspiration to other protocols. The Signal protocol based itself on OTR. Um, so we wanted to first update OTR. Only in the past, uh, Trevor Perrin, when we first pushed the first draft of the OTR, he suggested us that we should also publish the first draft on the mailing list that uh, modern curves have. Um, but we have not closely collaborated with them. Now, around the second question, which is around video and audio, you can always support them uh, in OTR if you want encryption of video or attachments, uh, you can always use a thing that's called the extra symmetry key for those purposes. Yeah, so it was actually already implemented in the OTR version 3, so um, except no actual implementation happened. Thank you. Uh, microphone number one. Well, my question is related to the capability of OMIMO to support multiple devices, which is very important in a modern world, and I wanted to know if OTR v4 can do this and still provide its stronger say, uh, deniability guarantees. Thanks so much for your question. This actually moves us to <laughs> this. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> OK, um, <laughs> this, <laughs> this is a common question that we have. And as part of the question, I think it's also important to answer this. So right now, OTRv4, and since OTRv3, OTR has a thing called instance size that is the ones that actually um, identify several devices. So when you send a message, you will only be identified to that specific device. There's not multi-synchronization of devices, because that will create some privacy concerns. Um, so that's not there. Like multi synchronization between devices is not there. But of course, um, you can use several devices. And if the device recognizes which instant stack, that, instant stack that belongs to, it will always send to the correct device. Um, if you want difference with Omimo, is that, of course, uh, OTI before and OTI is more agnostic. Uh, and by this, it means that OTI can be built upon any other messaging protocol that they exist, not only XMPP. If you want to build OTR over I IRC, you can do so. And even today, because we supported offline messages, you can also build it if you want as an email. And of course, OTR has better deniability properties. I have not seen any paper that actually said deniability properties in the 
concern of multi-synchronization devices. Maybe that's something interesting to look upon. And of course, OTI before has a little bit of much more well-defined specification. Thank you. As a reward for unlocking the secret slides, we're going to have a question from microphone one again. Um, yeah, apologies. This might actually be out of scope, but one of the problems with messaging apps like on your phone is not just the encrypted chat session, but discovering people and matching people to initiate first their first contact. Do you have thoughts on how that might, you know, on, on how that problem gets addressed? Okay, that's the contact discovery problem, right? Um, <laughs> so basically, that is much more in the sense of something that is deployable in a mobile devices um, and of a client. And right now, OTI, right now we're at the stage of doing the protocol and doing the basic library. So if someday we start working into a client that is going to be supported by mobiles, then of course we will have to tackle that problem. But right now in OTR we have not tackled that because it's not part of the main protocol. It might be an extension for clients that want to develop that on the mobile environments. I think it also depends on like what kind of like messaging protocol you use on the need, right? Like this will be sort of tough for like IRC, but like maybe XMPP also is not really the problem. But then if you get into like the sort of mobile landscape and everything changes and it's like more complicated, um, which is something, yeah. Thank you. Uh, microphone three, please. Um, could you elaborate a bit more about why group chat isn't possible and do you think it will be possible in the future? Because I think it would be really important for daily usage. Yes. <laughs> so um, there has been some efforts in the past, as we know. There was at least one effort some years ago about doing MPOTR. And right now, there's even a very nice paper that is called, um, where is this? Ah, here. Um, yes, this last paper, uh, Secure Messaging, is the one that actually defines like all of the properties that some um, secure messaging protocol has to have in order to also support group chat. And the thing is that there's right now not a good uh, way of achieving the same deniability properties that you want um, with the current, current cryptographic algorithms that we have. Now, about the future, that actually looks very bright. I remember that we attended PETS 2018, and Nicholas Hopper already presented a paper around uh, group chat and deniability, which was interesting. It didn't cover up all of the secure properties that you need for group chat, but it was very interesting. And during that same uh, conference, Nick Unger also um, told us that he's preparing a paper around good deniability in the sense of group chat. So that is something that may be happening in the future. Thank you. One more question from the internet. Could you explain how OTR before forward secrecy is stronger than signals, uh, referring to the protocol comparison slide? Yeah. <laughs> so basically, um, this depends on the kind of A key of DAG that you use. Signal uses right now one DAG that is called X3DH, uh, Extended Triple Diffie-Hellman. That is the one that, provide, that gives this weak forward secrecy. Um, the double ratchet algorithm, of course, gives perfect forward secrecy, but the start of the deck with the, with the double ratchet algorithm is the problem. How you will define weak forward secrecy is that only, it will only protect the deck, will only protect the session key when, on, when both parties complete the deck exchange. And in OTI before, we wanted to give perfect forward secrecy since the start of the day, meaning that it will provide a strong forward secrecy even if one party only finished the day. In Signal, you have to wait for both parties to actually finish and complete the day exchange to, uh, to have the forward secrecy. But in OTI before, we wanted to have that in a strong way. Thank you. Question from microphone one. Uh, in the links, there was a mention of a, a pre-key server. Is that a server-side requirement like Signal does? Sorry, is that the, a what? A pre-key server. Yeah, yeah. In um, the links. Is it's that, the same as Signal, you're asking? Yeah, I think Signal has some requirement in the server-side. Is that a requirement for OTR too? 
Signal defines also an untrusted server. I don't know that much in a requirement from an implementation standpoint, but our requirement from OTI before is also that it's an untrusted pre-key server, meaning that we take all of the precautions that is needed when you're using an untrusted pre-key server. We define the limitations because you can have a lot of denial of service attacks, like someone can drag all of the, pre the ephemeral material that you have on the pre-key server, someone can can make, um, yeah, someone can publish there something else. So we wanted to have all of the security um, considerations when using an untrusted pre-key server. Like, for example, the submissions that we do to the pre-key server are always authenticated also in a denial way with the server. Um, we don't use a signal because signals in the case that, for example, you run out of ephemeral keys, signal will use a static one uh, per default. In those cases, we didn't want it to use that because that actually can go against some deniability properties. So we, in the case that there's no more ephemeral material in the pre server, we just wait until someone publishes more to the pre server. Thank you. What? And of course, an untrusted pre-key server, yeah, thank you, is not required unless you want to support offline messages. Some protocols may only want to implement the online version of OTR because, I don't know, those are their requirements. Only if you need to use offline uh, asynchronous communication is that you will have a pre-key server. Thanks. Uh, one last question from microphone one. I wanted to know if you um, worked a bit in the, between the integration of OTR v4 and the other protocol, actually. One of the strengths of OMEMO is that it's perfectly well defined with how the key, where the key are stored in X, uh, XMPP uh, between the account and how they are exchanged. And then it gives you a really nice and well defined way of where to find the keys in, uh, in XMPP. While on OTR, you always have this like pre uh, little tag on the body of the messages, which is a bit ugly and uh, like. So I, would, I wanted to know if you had some thoughts about and or if you do some work for TRV4 regarding the integration of TRV4 and the other protocol. Right. So um, you know, it's slightly easier for Omimo in some way because it's uh, it, it works only over XMPP. Um, and with the OTRV4 protocol, we can sort of like. Uh, federates over, you know, what kind of, well, I mean, not federate, but um, get it to work over any messaging uh, protocol. Now, of course, if you would do something like a pre-key server over ISC, that might get tricky in some way. Um, so th that might not entirely be possible. Um, so I think it sort of depends on what kind of messaging protocol is underneath and sort of try and figure out how we can implement these things. And maybe we should sort of move to messaging protocols that sort of take these things into consideration, right? To have a sort of extension that we can build upon uh, where we can actually plug like pre-key servers into it. Um, it's sort of like the... Uh, the yeah. reasoning I would use, I don't know, if you yeah. have. So one of the properties, of course, of OTI is that it should be agnostic to any protocol that it's, it will build upon. So specifically defining the XMPP properties or the XMPP things that we need for OTI will not be part of OTI, but maybe from a separate document in which we can give recommendations for implementers upon building upon XMPP. On the actual implementation, we haven't found that much trouble. The only trouble in the XMPP thing implementation that we found out is that we actually needed to uh, discover the pre-key server. And when we were using the PG in, um library, there was not an exposed header for actually doing that. So we had to do some tricks to actually do that. Thank you. That was the last question. Thank you for the amazing <laughs> talk. Thank you for your work. Thank you.